use drugs and alcohol. Yeah, it gives them a temporary relief. Um, and what I often say. <clears throat> but that's the key, it's temporary. There it is. They don't know that. And so sometimes we have to have a conversation about this because people don't think about that. Um, if using drugs and alcohol took care of the problem, then they wouldn't have to use the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. So I talk to my clients about the fact that when people experience pain, um, using drugs and alcohol is, is one, is, is don't, don't use drugs and alcohol to deal with pain simply because it doesn't work. Um, and, and, and that's my whole argument is if it worked, you wouldn't have to use it again and again and again and again and again. We actually have to, as a culture, um, and we do this individually and then hopefully as a culture we get there, we have to be comfortable with addressing healing pain and dealing with pain. Um, because if we do that successfully, um, then it opens up and unlocks a lot of other things in our life for us. But it gives us a temporary relief. Now, there's lots of other things people do besides use of drugs and alcohol um, to deal with pain that are, that are unhealthy. Um, so let's real quick list off five to ten of them. What do we got besides drugs and alcohol that people do? Exercise. Uh, exercise. So some people go and they go too far with exercise in an unhealthy way. So I had a client who uh, was married. He worked about um, 50, 55 hours a, work, a week had a young kid, and when he got home from work, he would go out and train for a triathlon. Um, him and his wife were about to get divorced. Very inappropriate, his exercising, because um, not to exercise, but the amount that he was. Um, it was it was really, what else? Overeating. Overeating, yes. We are um, the fattest country in the history of mankind <coughs> right now. Um, so... It's amazing when you, go, when you can make that statement in the history of mankind. Um, but yes, yes, overeating. What else we got? Um, act out abusively with our people. Okay, we act out abusively. We hurt people um, through our words, through our actions, through what we do. So we act out abuse. Yes, we'll take two more. Retail therapy. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we go in debt shopping. What is it about shopping that just... Every once in a while, I just get in the mood I want to buy something because I want to feel better. I, it, it is. It is. It's a dopamine. Um, and and it's, it's just a piece that it is there. And so there are many um, Americans, I think they say the average adult is $10,000 in debt, in credit card debt. And most of that debt is not something they really needed. It wasn't like they needed a fridge for the home that they spent it on. They spent it on something else. Um, so we can go on to our screens, devices. I mean, we go on and on and on and on. Temporary relief, after temporary relief comes negative, um, negative consequences. These could be small or big. And what's interesting about these negative consequences is that most people don't want to see them, right? We call this thing called denial. Um, what it really is is the fact that um, people have their elevator speech. They have their argument for why they, they should do And it's not just substance use. This is us, too. Um, I often will do this activity called 10 Things I Should. And I'll have people write out a list of things. And we all know several of them. For me, my most classic one is, I should go to bed on time. Well, guess what? It's not going to happen anytime soon. I know I should go to bed earlier. And I know I don't need to sit up and watch that episode of The Office that I've seen. I don't know how many times. <laughs> but I'm watching it with my, my older two now. And it's fun to see them laugh. Um, but I don't need to do this. But yet, I'm not going to go to bed. And, and, and it's just, I know it. So when it comes to this piece of negative consequences, um, we just don't want to see it and hear it sometimes. But negative consequences push us to shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. And that just adds more back in here to pain. So the solution to cycle of addiction is not to find an answer to pain, but find ways to manage pain in a healthy way. Um, because um, all of us, experience it, whether it's uh, boredom, whether we don't feel accepted, whether um, it's some physical pain, um, we all experience pain. And so what do we do for people um, in treatment is first we develop relationships with them, um, and then we try to really find out what is driving their behavior, so what is that psycho psychological piece to it, and then how do we address that. And some of that is replacing it with some positive behaviors, um, but more than that, uh, we really have to drive down and drill down into um, what really is going on and why is that going on there and try to find some healing for that. 
and that is a long process. Just to give you some numbers, um, I might have it here. If I do, all right. Um, I got time. I'll do. I'll do this because I like doing it this way. Um, substance abuse outcomes when it comes to treatment um, run very similar to some other other diseases and, and things that we have in this world. So um, my father-in-law had a heart attack probably, uh, I think it was six or seven years ago, um, and the doctor um, gave him three simple things to do. You need to take his medication, you need to eat a moderately healthy diet, you need to walk at least three times a week. Americans who have this doctor's order and says, if you do this, you probably won't have another heart attack. If you do, you probably have another one, or you have a good chance of having one, you're probably going to die. What percentage of, doc, of, of, of people follow doctor's orders? I do. You do? All right. Are you the norm? Probably not. You are not. I'd say probably one or two out of ten. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a little bit higher. It's 30 to 35 percent. Um, so um, still a lot, most of them don't. Um, diabetes. So uh, I'll tell you my diabetes story. I was a, I was a medic in the Army and doing the reserves, and they were trying to get me to be a nurse because they needed nurses. And so um, I was doing my reserve time in, when I was going to college in uh, Kent County, and uh, they took a one-year LPN. They took all my medic training. Then they took a one-year LPN piece, and they put them together, and I had two and a half years of going one week in a month, two weeks in the summer for reserve to become an LPN. Um, one of the things we did is we did our clinicals, and we did them at Kent Community Hospital, um, which was a, a retirement, like a retirement home-ish kind of place with people with high medical needs. Why there versus the ER? Yeah, I don't think the ER wanted the, the medic, medics there, and uh, we had to have them somewhere to have our clinical so we could get our, they, all they wanted us to do is get our LPN. That's all they wanted. Um, and so one of my patients uh, was a person who had diabetes. Um, diabetes has a pathology of um, early, early onset of diabetes, the pathology where you can begin to lose um, blood flow to the extremities and you can end up um, having to have some amputations over time. And so they show everyone when you're young and you get this, they watch the videos and they say, do three simple things. Eat a moderately healthy diet, have moderate exercise three times a week, take your medication. It's a pretty simple, I mean, it's, it sounds like a sounds like the same treatment plan. Like, really, do doctors need to go to school for that many years when they get the same treatment plan? Um, I'm sure it's much more complicated than that. Um, what percentage of um, people who follow doctors, or, or how many people follow doctors' orders when it comes to diabetes? Probably about the same. About 30, 35%. So um, my story with this person with diabetes is that uh, I got this, I was reading the file, trying to prepare myself to go in and create a treatment plan for this person. And when I went in and met this lady, um, she did not follow doctor's orders and had a few amputations. In fact, when I met her, um, she all she had left was two stumps here. And you can't amputate obviously any higher than that, you begin to get into organs. And so um, I was there to then assist them with a procedure they would do twice a week where they would um, take and cauterize um, a big blade and they would basically basically um, burn out all the gangrene, all the rotten flesh and try to reseal that so that um, they could extend her life by, you know, four more days and four more days and four more days, those kind of things. Um, I, universal precautions, I, I got to hold the stump um, and so I had burning, rotten human flesh um, through my gloved hands, and I made it for about a minute, and I was dry heaving in the corner. So I'm not proud to say that, but I, I say that to simply say, if people have, and if they've seen this, it's a risk, and if people don't follow through with that. When it comes to substance use, here's the numbers: 35% of people who have a drug alcohol problem um, make significant change, and it takes them five to six episodes of treatment. So by episode, we're talking about somebody coming to see the short and small guy for um, three months. That could be one episode. Um, so five to six, some people do it the first episode, they're good. Other people do it the 30th time. Um, and uh, a lot of people don't ever make significant changes. But five to six treatment episodes is, is, is the norm when it comes to substance abuse treatment. So just to kind of give you that context. How do you convince them that sure. it's a bad deal? Yep. Are we talking about kids now? Or are we talking about everybody? Everybody. Okay. Yep, that's, that's the numbers. Um, because most people don't hit the five or six until they're well into young adulthood or adulthood. Okay. Um, so so that the, what does treatment look like? First piece of what we know is that engagement is key. So 40% of change is client strengths. Has almost nothing to do with me, uh, has nothing to do with my relationship with them. Has to do with 
their IQ, their family support, their past successes, those kind of pieces. 30% of change um, comes right down to the relationship. So if I can um, develop a relationship in an appropriate way where we can um, have a, a uh, where we can be honest with each other, where we can be trusted together, then I've done good beginning work on that. Because then what happens is people's elevator speech on why they like to use drugs and alcohol, that begins to come down and they, we can have a real conversation about things. 15% um, of change is expectancy, 15% is technique. So once we have that engagement with people, what we want to do is begin to listen about, um, we actually have to listen to what the drug, what they like about their substance, so then they're willing to talk about what they don't like about it. It's this piece, um, um, there's a technique called motivational interviewing, and what it shows, and, and, and uh, um, the research shows that if there's two people um, who have a dis difference of opinion, and they have a little disagreement argument, at the end of the disagreement, they're each more convinced they're right. You didn't bring someone, in, 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 and, I, and I use this, I've been using this for years, and I used to think the joke was funny, I don't think it's funny anymore, but I'm still gonna give it to you. Um, if, if you. If you don't believe if that's true or not, just look at our political process. It has become so much more divisive than it used to be, but even back five, six years ago, if you had someone who was very far to the left and someone very far to the right, and you put them in a room together, there wasn't a dialogue, it was an argument, and then each person is more convinced they're right. So the same, I mean, so that's just a principle of human behavior. So what we have to do is we have to engage people, and then I have to get educated on what is it, what is it that they like about their substances. So we go back to the cycles, to the psychological piece. Uh, I like it because it helps me deal with stress, I like it because of blah, 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 and so I'll reflect back, make sure they know that I care about that, and then I can ask them, what are some things that maybe you don't like so much about it? Well, I have some problems with my family, uh, maybe I'm not doing so well with sports, I mean, it takes a little bit of time to get to that, but they can begin to make the argument for change as well. Um, and so once that begins to happen, you're beginning to make some progress, and there's these pieces called the stages of change. Um, and our job is to begin to help people work through the stages of change. There's a reason why it takes five or six treatment episodes sometimes, because sometimes people only get so far, and then they have to, um, then, they, then they go back out and they live, and they might use some more, and they might come back into treatment, those, those kind of pieces. So my job isn't necessarily to convince someone because I can't convince someone, because if I try to make an argument, it's not gonna work. My job is to engage with someone, listen to someone, hear about, um, hear from them, because honestly, they will begin to talk about some of the things they don't like so much about their substance use. And motivational interviewing um, talks about that, and that it's change talk. So they might talk about desires. Well, I wish um, this was different, um, or abilities or hopes. And those are the things I want to reflect back to someone and have them think about it. Um, when it comes to change, um, any of you guys ever gone out for coffee with a friend and all of a sudden shared a whole lot more than you were planning on sharing? 